Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities across Canada. We're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. Today on the show, we are going Alberta Municipalities. Last week, we were live on location at the 2023 annual Alberta Municipalities Trade and Conference Convention in Edmonton, Alberta. We have the results of the Alberta Municipalities presidential election and all other board member elections in today's episode. We also have reaction from newly elected President Tyler Gandam about the three-day conference and his vision for the future of the municipal organization. While at the conference, Federation of Canadian Municipalities President Scott Pierce was there, and we had the opportunity to ask him a few questions about his travels across Canada to different municipal conferences. We also have some follow-ups on two stories that we talked about last month, both regarding resolutions that were put forward at this year's municipal conference. We also had the chance to chat with two municipal leaders in northern Alberta who are leading a charge in making municipal tourism a priority with a fun project called the Municipals. And finally, diverting away from Alberta municipalities, the Atlantic Mayor Congress met in late September in Newfoundland and Labrador, and we caught up with Port Hawkesbury Mayor and President of Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, Brenda Chisholm Beaton, about the Congress and the key takeaways from these two day conference meetings. But first, we head to Edmonton, where Tyler Gandam, Mayor of Wetaskiwin, emerged victorious as the newly elected president of the Alberta municipalities. The election, held at the annual conference show in Edmonton, saw Gandam defeat formidable opponents Trina Jones, mayor of Legal, and Andre Shabbat, councillor for the city of Calgary, in a contest that was filled with anticipation and enthusiasm. Gandam garnered 310 votes, or 60.5% of the total vote count, while Jones came second with 152 votes, or 29.7% of the vote, and Chabot rounded out the result with only 50 votes, or 9.8% of the total votes cast. Other successful candidates for board position at this year's 2023 Alberta Municipalities Convention were for Director of Cities up to 500,000, Airdrie Councillor Tina Petro and City of Spruce Grove Councillor Aaron Stevenson took the two vacant director positions. For Directors of Towns East, Mayor Trina Jones defeated challenger Mayor Carl Hotch. For Vice Presidents of Towns, Councillor Krista Gardner was victorious over challenger Legal Mayor Trina Jones. For the election of Vice President of Villages and Summer Villages, Deputy Mayor of the Village of Duchess, Alberta, Deborah Reed Mickler, came out on top over incumbent Bruce McLeod of the Village of Acme. After the three-day conference, newly elected President Tyler Gandam spoke to the media outlining what was accomplished during the three-day conference. We had about 1,200 delegates join us from across the province. It was a great, great time to reconnect build some new relationships and continue that networking that we uh, find so valuable. Uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors that made all of this possible as well. Uh, we also had some really good sessions and some good takeaways. There was a lot of people talking about the session that they got the opportunity to sit in, learn from, and then that of course carries the conversation on to their councils and back to their home communities. Some of the key resolutions that we were discussing there were First and foremost, the additional ask of $1 billion to the LGFF um, base funding. Right now, the province is um, offering $722 million. Alberta Municipalities has gone through and worked through a formula that's going to work for hopefully all of our communities across the province. And a big part of that is making sure that we get that base funding mount up to $1.75 billion. Some of the other ones were about affordability. Speaking to that um, infrastructure deficit across the province. We're looking at about a $30 billion deficit for our communities across the province. So it's imperative that we see some support from the provincial government. We heard a lot about uh, housing, the shortages, and of course the affordability with that as well. We heard from not only Edmonton and Calgary, but some of the smaller communities too who are facing that affordability problem. 
Healthcare was something else that we addressed here. We had the opportunity to speak with Premier Danielle Smith, as well as about 12 ministers here who were doing a, a panel discussion and taking questions from the audience. They heard a lot of the concerns that our municipalities are facing as well. Um, healthcare, wait times, EMS, uh, fire departments, uh, helping out with EMS and responding to calls as their first response. And then some of the other resolutions takes into consideration uh, support for our bylaw and CPO officers for PTSD and mental health supports, as well as making sure that our municipalities are looked after financially for offering those supports with um, first response from their fire departments. Many of our fire departments across the province are paid on call or volunteer, and it puts a strain on the communities that we have there, their employers, and of course their home life when they're getting called out to help with that EMS support. Mental health and addictions, uh, the social needs that we have from across the province, and I can speak to that, I think, fairly well, being the mayor for the city of Wetaskiwin. Uh, we're facing much higher uh, people's experiencing homelessness than we ever have before, and I know that that's not only in Wetaskiwin, but we are certainly seeing the effects of mental health and addictions, and we're looking forward to the province's reaction and, and response to that too. We spoke a little bit about justice, um, bail reform, and then the increasing calls for our RCMP or our police services across the province. Uh, we're looking for some help with that as well, not having it just a revolving door through the justice system. Uh, I can appreciate that we're not going to be able to police our way out of many of the problems that we have, but it is certainly part of the solution that we have to work, more, or to work on moving forward. Uh, lastly, we spoke a little bit about party politics. We had a resolution come up. We also had a um, session on that as well, um, highlighting maybe some of the unintended consequences of moving to a party system within municipal politics. Um, Premier spoke about that this morning during her address, saying that they are looking into it to see if there is some merit to it. Uh, she's, she has seen that in other regions that are, are looking at party politics and hoping to get better voter turnout uh, during our municipal elections, and that was something that uh, they'll be looking at as well. Gandon went on to say that he hopes to build off the legacy that past President Kathy Heron, mayor of St. Albert, built for the municipal organization. I don't think it's going to be different. I, one, of my, my, one of my takeaways and one of the things that I've focused on in my professional life is building relationships. Um, I think Kathy's done a really good job uh, leading the association. She's done a really good job of building those relationships and what I want to do is make sure that I continue those relationships as well as build new ones as well, whether that's with media, with the provincial government, with uh, the federal government, as well as our members. We heard uh, fairly loudly during one of our resolutions that members aren't feeling heard and that's coming from smaller communities, towns and villages, but we're hearing that from the mid cities as well as the big cities as well. So if everybody is feeling like they're not being heard or that uh, maybe resources aren't being allocated the way that they should be for that specific group, um, I think it's really important that our association, our members feel heard and that I'm as available as I possibly can be to make sure that I'm their voice and I'm hearing what they need or what, they, what they're looking for. He also went on to say that he hopes to build a working relationship with Premier Danielle Smith. Again, the relationship that uh, I've already built with the Premier, uh, she spoke about it this morning. We happen to be uh, hanging out together at the Pinocchio Stampede and during the parade. So what I'm really looking forward to is that opportunity to, to build that relationship with the Premier and with the provincial government. And I think it speaks volumes when she comes here and, and addresses the association, addresses the membership, but also takes the time for the question and answer period after that. Uh, and again, I'm really thinking that our government is hearing what our municipalities are looking for and the support that they need. So. Scott Pierce, the president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, was in attendance at this year's Municipalities Conference in Alberta. Pierce has been on the forefront of discussions and developments in municipalities across Canada for the last few months. And now we were lucky to get a few minutes with President Pierce to share some invaluable insights into what he's been hearing and observing at municipal conventions taking place throughout the country. Now, municipalities are the heartbeat of our nation where local issues and concerns are addressed and policies are shaped to impact our everyday lives. These conventions provide a unique platform for municipal leaders to come together, exchange ideas, and collaborate on solutions to some of the most pressing issues 
and challenges facing our communities across Canada. In our exclusive interview with President Pierce, he will shed light on the key issues and trends emerging from these conventions, touching on topics such as sustainable development, infrastructure investment, and a new fiscal framework for all municipalities. Scott, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, now, you've been to Ontario, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. You've been to the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. You're here at the Alberta Municipalities Conference. What are you hearing? What's the general sense from municipal leaders from across Canada that you're hearing as president of FCM? Well, a few things. Um, obviously, the, the fact that we manage 60% of the country's infrastructure with 10 cents on the tax dollar, and the feds and the provinces keep 45 cents each. So that's tough to deal with. Uh, it's tough on mayors and councillors, and uh, that's why we're asking for a new fiscal framework uh, to go forward and, and answer the needs of the people in our communities. One of the ones that, that's more recent is a bit of frustration when provincial and federal politicians try to blame municipalities for the housing crisis. Um, we're trying to get it done, obviously, but rather than laying blame, we'd rather they come and work with us and let's find solutions, because laying blame is not laying foundation. So. That, that's one. Um, so just on that sense, so the, most of the municipal organizations are calling on their provincial governments to ask for more money. You're asking the federal government as well. Yep. They go hand in hand in some sense because there is only one taxpayer. And that's you right. Know that. I know that as a mayor. Um, what do you see as your next steps? You're meeting with all these municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. What do you do with this information that you've gathered with in Ottawa when you meet with ministers, the prime minister? For me, it's always about talking reality, being respectful, but holding our ground as municipalities. Um, to me, we're an equal order of government. We're the ones on the ground. We're the experts locally. Um, a bureaucrat in Quebec City doesn't know the needs of my community. I do, and my council does, and my, my staff do. So sometimes it's more of work with us and learn how things are on the ground before criticizing municipalities, because like the housing is a, is a prime example of that. We all want to build housing. But we also have provincial land use regulations that we have to deal with. So when a federal politician is criticizing the municipalities, they're forgetting that in between is the province. And in Quebec, in my region, for example, we're limited as to what we can do for development because they're trying to avoid urban sprawl and, and so they're trying to densify the bigger cities. So it makes it hard for me to, to get involved in the housing crisis because I'm limited. I'm not even allowed to open new roads at this point. So what they want us to do is densify the existing roads. But if you're building housing for people who need it, it's very hard to do it one-off. You need a, a new road, a, a new land development. So it's more complicated than, than they make, make people think. And Shocker. It's, it's, it, you know, it is frustrating. It's, I find it's hurtful because, you know, mayors and councillors all over the country work very, very hard. And not in the spotlight, not in the media, but they work hard every day. And every little success that brings them pride and happiness. So to have other orders, you know, I'd rather have them at the table working with us instead of shifting the blame on files. And, and I think that's the message I have. Now, I wouldn't get away without asking this question because we are at the Alberta Municipalities Conference. Yeah. Yesterday, President Kathy Heron, by the time this airing last week, former President Kathy Heron, mm -hmm. um, talked about how municipalities are with a $30 billion deficit for infrastructure. Oh, yeah. Is that just in Alberta or is this happening across Canada? And while the Alberta Municipalities is calling on Premier Smith to do something, are you hearing similar calls from other uh, municipal organizations to their Premier? It's amazing how alike municipalities are. <laughs> I mean, everywhere from coast to coast. It's the same problem, the same issues. We have solutions. We just want them to sit down with us more and discuss solutions. And um, yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, whether you're in a, a little tiny town in Quebec or you're in Vancouver, it's the same issues. You know, it's road work, it's infrastructure. The deficit of infrastructure is huge across the country, and municipalities don't have that fiscal framework to deal with it at this point. So that's what FCM is doing, is really trying to sit down and have these discussions and find solutions. It's easy to blame each other, but that doesn't solve the problem for Canadians. And let's sit down and figure it out together. So my final question for you here, Scott, is uh, you talk about the fiscal framework. Now, FCM has been passionate about yep. getting a new fiscal framework for municipalities. This doesn't happen overnight, and municipalities needs an need answers now. So what do municipalities need to do in the short term to make sure that they are set up for the long term until the new fiscal framework is actually installed? I say it everywhere I go, talk to your MP. The Prime Minister or the Premier, they have MLAs or, or MPs. 
the more that they feel the pressure, the more the Prime Minister or the Premier will feel the pressure. So as municipalities, we've got to get on that phone, we've got to talk to our MPs and explain how bad it is. And, you know, it's easy to show what's going on. I think we have the proof. Uh, the FCM has done a great job of building this file, and uh, I think that's what it has to be. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to say pressure is a negative context, you know, but making sure the MPs understand, because, you know, not many of them have been mayors before or councillors, so they don't know exactly what we deal with on the ground, and we are the experts on the ground. Right. So as you say, you're the government of proximity. the government of proximity, baby. <laughs> Scott, thank you so much for the doing this. Greatly it's great it. to see you again, Chris. Thank Always. you. Cross border interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on cross border interviews where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. Now picking up on two stories from last month. At the annual convention of Alberta municipalities, a resounding message was sent by delegates from across the province. Partisan politics should stay out of local government. The gathering attended by municipal representatives from various communities expressed their concerns over potential intrusion of political parties into local governance. This sentiment was amplified by strong support against the idea from municipal leaders from across the province. The City of Brooks led the charge by presenting a resolution focused on preserving the independence of local candidates which was met with overwhelming support. The resolution was further divided into two separate proposals, both aimed at curbing partisan influence into local politics. In a remarkable show of unity, 94% of delegates voted in favor of keeping local candidates independent, signaling their unwavering commitment to nonpartisan local governance. The City of Brooks proposal clearly resonated with those in attendance as the overwhelming majority chose to protect the grassroots nature of local elections. Councillor Marissa Wardrop of Brooks said that she wasn't surprised of this passage. I'm, I'm pleasantly unsurprised. I really had a lot of faith that uh, this is the way it was going to go. Um, Largely because, you know, like I, I said in my in my um, little bit there, that we we all are here for a common purpose, and we feel passionately about the job that we do, and and we take it seriously that we are the direct voice for the people that you know put their faith in us to serve, and um, it was just it was really encouraging and inspiring to see all of our colleagues kind of come together and 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 send that strong message that we do not want partisanship to to take away from the the integrity of of local government councillor mohammed idris also from the city of brooks said the passage sends a clear message to the provincial government yeah i think this was a very clear message uh, sent to the provincial government to anyone else who thought differently that uh, municipal election needs to stay uh, non-partisan, um, even with the parliamentary maneuver that happened in, in, in trying to split the, the, the motion or the resolution, uh, the audience showed that this is really what they want, and, and we were very happy with that. The second aspect of the resolution, which called for changes to the Provincial Election Act to prohibit partisan donations and endorsements in local politics, received slightly less but still significant support with 80% of delegates in favor. This demonstrates that many within Alberta municipalities seize the potential pitfalls of partisan politics and wish to address them proactively. Councillor Wardrop says prior to the vote, she had heard from municipal leaders at the convention that they were in full support of the resolutions. Uh, talk to, I, I say countless, countless other elected officials and, and other delegates. And um, I have not come across one person who is, is fundamentally opposed to, to the idea of, um, of nonpartisan municipal elections and decision making. Um, I would say like 99% of, of all feedback that I got was 
like purely like, yes, we are 100% on board, we support you. Um, the only thing was like, you know, like that the concerns about the little, little uh, wordage, you know, those sorts of things. Um, overall, resounding support. The sentiments expressed during the convention reflect a growing concern that the involvement of political parties in local governments could lead to division and confrontational politics, potentially hindering effective governance at the community level. Delegates cited a strong preference for local representatives who prioritized the interest of their communities over party lines. However, and this is a big however, it is important to note that the resolution passed by Alberta municipalities is not binding and would require further legislative action by the province to become law. Councillor Idris said that work has already gotten underway around working with the province. We actually have already started. Uh, we have talked with the Alberta municipalities even before uh, the, the motion passed this morning. And, and, and we believe that now it's Alberta municipalities' uh, role to really make this into a campaign and, and, and really show the government that this is what we want, this is what our constituents want, and, and this is not something that we are just going to advocate once and stop. No, we are going to make sure it gets done. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I call on Alberta municipalities to really support us and, and, and come behind us and, and do the work that needs to be done to, to get to the finish line. Now, it should be noted that during the provincial leader speeches, Premier Danielle Smith did allude to the idea that her government was considering the introduction of partisan politics at the municipal level. Now, the other story that we've been watching during the convention was the allowance of golf carts on municipal roads in Alberta. A resolution put forward by the summer village of Half Moon Bay requested that the provincial government allow communities the right to have golf carts on designated municipal roadways. The resolution was supported by 70% of those in attendance. Mike Pashik, the president of the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta, said that he was happy to see the resolution passed. Well, I'm feeling good. You know, the, uh, the resolution passed. 70% uh, of the members uh, agreed with our resolution. And, uh, you know, during the, the discussion, you know, one member municipality came up and had some concerns over the safety aspects on the operation of golf carts. And, and that's fine, you know, um, this resolution is really the starting point. And when the government of Alberta then starts to talk a little bit more in detail, they will include safety factors, will they include insurance requirements, I don't know. But we see those types of things in the other jurisdictions, Saskatchewan, BC and Ontario all have included safety factors uh, for the operation of golf carts on designated municipal roads. So I, I'm, I'm feeling good about it. President Pashik says that he hopes that work can begin behind the scenes to get the changes to the Highway Safety Act done by next spring. I, you know, I, I see it as an easy solution. You know, uh, somebody uh, said there on the uh, City of Edmonton's micro-mobility resolution, the Alberta Traffic Safety Act hasn't changed for a long time. And, and so they need to come into the modern era. Uh, E-scooters, golf carts, all sorts of those things uh, need to happen. It creates connection. It allows uh, an alternative form of transportation. I think that uh, it'll be easy to do. I, I do hope that by next summer, we will see uh, the legal use of golf carts in uh, towns that then create a bylaw. So it's a bit of a two-step process. You know, we need changes by the Alberta government, and then a municipality has to decide for themselves and pass a bylaw. So, you know, that two-part process might take some time, but I would think for some of the municipalities, they'll start working on that bylaw early and have that shelf ready and, uh, and be ready for when the snow leaves next year. He also added that the ASVA will be working with their 51 member communities to help craft bylaws for the use of golf carts on municipal roadways. You know, really, that's what the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta is about. It's about helping those 51 municipalities uh, get something ready. And, and there's, uh, there's great benefit for having a pre-built, standardized bylaw that each one of us can use. We don't have 
the resources for every one of us to go out and create something brand new. And so, yes, our ASVA board, that's exactly what we'll work on in, over the next couple of months. Some sort of standard form municipal bylaw that's easily tailored to their specific use, but something that helps them get prepared very quickly. During the Alberta Municipalities Conference, I had the chance to chat with two dynamic municipal leaders from Northern Alberta who were embarking on an extraordinary journey across Alberta, all in the name of promoting the hidden gems and untold stories of this beautiful province. Together, Anna Underwood, Councillor for the Town of Wembley, and Kate Potter, Mayor for the Town of Sexsmith, have taken the Alberta tourism scene by storm with their innovative and exciting project, The Municipals. This isn't your average travel program, though. It's a captivating adventure that's putting the spotlight on communities off the beaten path. In a remarkable partnership with Alberta municipalities, Anna and Kate have set out on a road trip like none other. They are crisscrossing Alberta, driving through scenic landscapes and diving deep into the heart of towns and communities that often go unnoticed. Their mission is simple and yet powerful to showcase the vibrant and diverse tourism opportunities that exist in the lesser known places, highlighting the rich cultural aspects and natural wonders and the incredible people who call these communities home. Now, we caught up with Mayor Potter and Councillor Underwood to get them to share their incredible journey with us, the stories that they've uncovered, and how they're making a real impact on Alberta's tourism landscape. It's a road trip you won't want to miss. First off, I want to thank you both, uh, Mayor. Oh my God, I forgot We're your last starting. name. Potter. Potter, yes, and Anna Underwood, Councillor Underwood and Mayor Potter. Okay, yes, we are starting. It's and a pleasure guys, to be here. These guys aren't going to try and talk as they did the last <laughs> time during my interview with Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, so yeah. let's see if they can do it. Right, right, Scott? Oh, yeah, you, you nailed it. <laughs> um, your Worship, Councillor, thank you both so much for doing this today. Um, I, I want to start with the basic big question. And it's kind of the weirdest question I think I've ever asked on this show. Perfect. But who is the municipals? <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, Your Worship, and Councillor Underwood, we mostly go by Kate and Anna. Okay. <laughs> so, so the municipals really is Kate and Anna. Kate and Anna. <laughs> and uh, it started just as a fun sort of brainstorming at FCM with another some other municipalities yeah. and, uh, and a couple of members of the AB Muni staff. And it just grew from our love of exploring new places, learning about people, learning about what we loved Toronto when we were at FCM. And so we said, okay, it would be really fun to do this in Alberta because we both love Alberta. Yeah, there was a lot of talk. Uh, there were a group of people on our t at our table from Lacombe, and they were very, like, she had a nice purse, and they were talking <laughs> about the nice food they had and stuff. Why have I never been to Lacombe? And that was sort of, wait a minute, we didn't know about this about Lacombe, and and we just went from there. Yeah. But how did this come about? Because this seems like oh. a friendship. <laughs> because that's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but oh. How did the friendship come about? Because Wembley, Sexsmith, uh, they're in the northeast area, northwest, sorry, uh, part of the province of Alberta. Uh, they're relatively close in the grand scheme of things of northern Alberta. <laughs> they are close together. Yes. So how did Kate and Anna get together and become uh -huh. mutual uh -huh. friends and sort of thought, think to themselves, this would be something that two people who are on council <laughs> would love to spend love eight to hours spend in a day <laughs> in a car? And maybe more. No. Um, you know, I've never really thought about it too much, but we were both elected in the same year, yeah. 2017. And because we're in a relatively close area, I think um, we naturally sort of started to get to know each other just because our councils, we did intermunicipal things as a region. And then actually- A few of these. Yeah, some conferences together, that helps. And so you just start to get to know. And I think for both of us, one of our, um, intentions with council when we got onto councils was building relationships with other communities and other councillors and and this naturally just happened because <laughs> Anna is so wonderful <laughs> we just connected yes, we just connected totally. it was 
it was unplanned. It wasn't like I, I'm going to go out and seek out Kate. Yeah. Uh, but now I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's really even FCM in Toronto. Yeah, we were at a different conference. I was going. Anna wasn't was going not. at that point. And I'm like, oh, how could you not be coming to, to Toronto? We need to get you there. I'm going. Yeah. Come and stay with me if you don't have a place to stay. Like, yeah. So it just really, it was just really a nice friendship that came out of work, but, but intentional trying to like make our region better and make our lives better. And, yeah. yeah, definitely. And, and we are like-minded as well as we, we, um, Feed off of each other quite nicely. <laughs> I can tell only in the first five minutes of the interview so far. Yeah, um, but, but uh, yeah, I think it's just been a really good fit. And the more I th- I feel, I don't know, she may be dead wrong. <laughs> I may be wrong, but the more we do it, the more I enjoy her, and the more yes. we, the more fun we have. And uh, so yeah. So you've been on part of the the tour already, yes. and you've gone to Lacombe, you've gone to Cal- Calmar. Uh, and a few other communities, and you're about to mention them as, as I ask this question. <laughs> um, how do you choose? How do you say, okay, this is the oh. community that we're going to choose? Because there are some, there are many great many. Men, uh, municipalities oh. across this province, and yes. I've had like gotten to a fraction of them. But for you, you guys are doing this in partnership with Alberta municipalities, but also through the Green Municipal Fund as well, if I'm not mistaken. The but, Municipal Climate Change Action Centre. There Center. you go. Yep. So how do, how do you two sit down and say, okay, where are we going to end up on this beautiful <laughs> Monday morning or Tuesday afternoon? It totally depends on how far the car will go. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> okay, so that was a major player because we had first said, okay, uh, because we were partnering with Alberta municipalities, they're based out of Edmonton, we said, okay, like let's look in that sort of central north East West region, like within a couple of hours of Edmonton. And then after we looked at that, then we uh, looked at how far the car would go. And we said, okay, we have to adjust a few things to make sure we make it to the next place, <laughs> which was good. It's a good, it's a good learning challenge, but it's, it was also good for us. And um, so some of the municipalities, so we, part of the reason why we chose Lacombe was because we met Lacombe at FCM. At okay. the table. And, and so they were part of sort of the initial chatter about it. Yeah. So we felt like it was a really great fit. And we wanted to highlight um, large municipalities, small municipalities. So then Caroline, the village of Caroline, we looked at, okay, we could... We sort of said, like, can we make sort of a... I don't even know what to call it. draw a picture really of thing. municipals of, <laughs> yeah. on Alberta with Where your car. Go. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, the village of Caroline was part of our uh, experience. Yeah. Edson, like you mentioned. Barhead, I had a sister. So funny oh, story. Right. Yeah. Anna said to me, so you have two sisters vacationing this year. One goes to South Africa and one went to Barhead. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good laugh. But because she went to Barhead and sent me pictures of these different things yeah, she did, we were like, great. Oh, what a fantastic community that we didn't even, we would have never thought, and it's nothing against Barhead, it's like people don't say, hey, I'm going to travel to Wembley or Sexsmith for vacation. They don't say that. But because somebody had been there, we we were willing to look at it. So we had Barhead and the Calmar, but that's exactly what municipals I think is about, yeah. is saying all of these communities have fantastic things to offer. And we don't even realize that they're there in our own backyard. So how do we make those things places that people want to go? Had you been to any of these communities prior to this uh, tour? I had not. You had not? No, I not at all. I went to because of the bakery. And that's like, <laughs> I mean, and we did go there We did go to tour. the bakery. But other than that, we had never been to any of the communities other than possibly driving through them. But I don't even think, like we've driven past Lacombe. I have highway. not. Well, that's, <laughs> if you've driven to Calgary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but so, it's like... so the question has to be, so tourism seems to be a major player into this whole endeavor that you two have sort of encompassed here. I believe that tourism is a major factor that mm. municipalities sort of drop the ball on. You're going and you're visiting these communities. You're seeing the tourism aspect up close and personal. What do you hope to take away from this? What do you hope that people will sort of get from the municipal's experience and what you're trying to get more municipalities to do in concert with it? I think what I'd like to see is when you're driving, when you're on your way to Calgary, instead of going to the typical stops that you always go to because that's 
the gasoline that, that, alleys, right, yes. Right, that you go off the beaten path a little bit and explore something new, right? And that's what a lot of it is about, just exploring something new and seeing what everything, every little town has something to offer and finding out what that is, is a lot of fun. So yeah. what's been the biggest thing for you that you found out about the Well, the biggest thing was the largest fishing lure. That was literally the biggest <laughs> thing. <laughs> Taking the journalist words <laughs> verbatim, I love it, Anna. Um, but for yourself, like you, you're probably learning something about your role as a counselor, as a mayor, in how you can do tourism a little bit better for your communities as well, how to get people off those streets. So what are you looking at when you're visiting these communities, when you're talking to the mayors of Kalmar, when you're talking to the mayor of Edison to get people to say, oh, I want to stop there and I want to actually potentially spend my economic dollars there? Who wants to take that? I, I can, I can yeah. start with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, we found is that for us, where every person is proud of their municipality, mm -hmm. 100%. As mm -hmm. an elected official, you are, you are giving 100% saying this is the best community that you could live in or a great community to live in. And, um, and I think part of what we wanted to say was it's not a competition. Like, I 100% want people to come to Sexsmith, but it benefits me if they also come to Wembley. Yeah. And so to be able to say, take that time, make a little stop off. Don't just, it's not about just getting to your destination. It's about enjoying the road as you get there. And so for us, even as a municipality, when I think of where we're investing, it's like, do we have the things that make people want to come off the road? Do we have the things, because, um, Sexsmith is built right up to the highway, yeah. but our, our main attractions, if you want to call it that, are not at the highway, they're downtown. So how do we get people to actually make the turnoff? And, and so thinking about things from a little bit of a different perspective that way as municipal leaders, I think is really critical. Um, although, full disclosure, we did not think, I would say, that was not our intent with municipals. Part of our intent with municipals was being able to say, Go to that community. I mean, we have oh, not 100%. highlighted. Oh, 100%. 100%. No, well, it wasn't, about, that, that it was wasn't be, about us. That was, was what a, I was going to end on is, why haven't you done your community? Yeah. No, <laughs> no, because there's, I've been to my community. <laughs> I've been to hers. How am I going to get? Yeah, there are a lot of really cool things in this province. Say, yeah, there is so much that we haven't experienced. We often focus so internally that we miss the opportunity to celebrate other people. Yeah. And when we celebrate other people, like if people come to Alberta and they come to Grand Prairie today, then tomorrow or next year or whenever, maybe they'll come to Sexsmith mm -hmm. and then maybe they'll come to Wembley or Beaver Lodge. And it's the same across the entire province. And so it's just starting to make them think about the off the beaten trail places that still have fantastic things. Like, I mean, the fishing lure, Alberta has the <laughs> funny, funny thing. Alberta has the largest uh, per capita number of world's largest things, which is a pretty crazy, <laughs> crazy opportunity for us to say, okay, these things are hidden and we didn't even know they were there. Yeah. So yeah. let's yeah. go find them. They're let's not really sure. hidden. They're huge. Yeah. Well, okay. Like <laughs> hidden in a subtle If you miss that lure, <laughs> you're hooked. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> um, so I know you've gone to these communities, you're visiting what's I, I, can i say there might be a potential audio video visual aspect ah, of this tour coming out here yeah you're <laughs> <back. laughs> yes hopefully hopefully next week so it's beginning of october we should have our first video out um and then we should have the rest from the tour in short succession after Pretty that quick after. yeah and where and can people find them they can find them on our Facebook page and Instagram, the Municipals. <laughs> we will be linking those in the show notes. Thank in you. case you didn't catch that Perfect same song. Municipals. <laughs> yeah, and we're also on YouTube, and so people can go and find us there and uh, and follow us. We would love to and keep, share. Yes, and share. We would love to keep going. We would love to yeah. keep touring and see more. Places. So there is there is a possibility of future if this is successful. That yes, reach yeah. out to us. We want to come and see. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes, do it really because do. they're yeah. amazing. Yeah. Thank you both, Anna and Kate, for doing this. This has been a wonderful pleasure to sit down. Well, not sit down, stand with you and talk There's about the, the municipal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks Thank so you. Much. That was fun. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most. 
in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. And now we turn our attention to an incident that sent shockwaves through the city of Leduc in June. During a council meeting and part of the public commentary section of that council meeting in June, a group of individuals arrived with strong opposition to the city's LGBTQ initiatives. Leduc, like many progressive municipalities throughout Canada, has been actively supporting the LGBTQ plus community, including the painting of a vibrant rainbow crosswalk in town and adorning a city bus with these inclusive colors. But in June, Mayor Bob Young noted that the city has been celebrating Pride for at least six years, emphasizing their commitment to fostering a diverse and inclusive community. However, at the last meeting in June, tensions flared during the meeting when the group's main spokesperson, identifying himself as Bill McDavid, voiced concerns about these initiatives. Mr. McDavid urged the council to seek the opinion of the entire city before undertaking projects such as painting crosswalks or raising flags that may not directly represent the country, province, or the city. He added that the city should not be seen as favoring one group over another. Now, in wake of this incident, Leduc Councillor Ryan Pollard, who called for order during the meeting, chatted with us at the recent Alberta Municipalities Conference. He shared insights into the fallout from the contentious public meeting and discussed the proactive steps Leduc is taking to ensure such incidents do not occur again. Councillor Pollard, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I, I want to start with sort of a follow-up from a story that happened earlier in, uh, I think it was June. It was June, moment. yes. Um, the city of Leduc kind of made some national headlines and not in a good way. Yeah. So I, 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 we haven't spoken about this issue since it happened. Can you just give me your insights of how you were feeling that day when this delegation was going on and these horrible things were being spewed? Sure. So, uh, month of June, Pride Month, yep. uh, and uh, we had a number of Pride initiatives. The uh, city of Leduc has been celebrating Pride for many years now, uh, and for whatever reason, the zeitgeist is such that uh, we're getting a lot of uh, pushback on that. And so this year, for the first time, we had a Pride crosswalk, and that was unveiled. Uh, and we we wrapped the, our main bus with a with a with Pride decals that say a seat for everyone. Uh, an inclusive community so that people feel safe and, and welcomed and valued in our community. And often there's there's pushback on those things. Not everyone's going to agree, and I don't expect everyone to agree, and I respect respectful disagreement. Well, and it doesn't mean that I'm going to agree with them. Um, but uh, later in the month, uh, some people came to public commentary. Uh, the, the, <clears throat> the gallery was full. Our galleries are, get pretty full nowadays. Uh, people watch online and they, they come and watch city council. So perversely, uh, people are more engaged in, in what's happening. And it, it, it's, a good, it's a good thing, but the, the reasons may, may not, not always be the, the, great, the greatest. Uh, so <clears throat> there was a, a couple that came to present, uh, non-residents, not, not from the city okay, of Okay, so that's a new part of the story that I haven't even heard yeah. about. Yeah, so not from the city of Leduc. Uh, and they wanted to advise on what the uh, the true meaning of the Pride Crosswalk is. Uh, presumably, well, we don't need to go through the details of what they said. No, I'm right? not going to. Exactly. I want to talk about your reaction. All right. Because you were the one that kind of spearheaded the saying, we need to shut this down. And you asked the mayor, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here at sure. all. But at what point in time did you was it coming or did you say okay this is enough so at what point in time during the speech did you say okay i can't sit here and stand there's a respectful part of my job and this is past the respectful part sure um well i'm going to respectfully say that i was respectful throughout uh, you were, okay but but listening to listening respectfully and listening to a respectful person giving their opinion are two different things that's that's true yes so at what point in time did you think that it crossed the line from being 
respectful to being disrespectful. Sure. So in my mind, yeah. uh, there's a difference between something I merely disagree with and m- merely disagree wholeheartedly with and something that crosses the line to something that affects the, I'm using the terms from Robert's Rules of Order, the privilege of the attendees at the meeting. Yeah. And that includes insults, defamation, things like that. It also includes like whether or not people can hear and things like that. That's what a point of privilege is for. And so I was raising points of privilege because the privilege of those gathered, the counselors, the people in, in the gallery that were not uh, supportive of the presenters, uh, they were being affected by defamatory statements. And so I was raising points of privilege and the people kept speaking and when they wouldn't, raising a point of order that they should attend to the they, they should stop and listen for the chair's ruling and it just went out of control from there and people were erupting in, in the audience um, threats were uttered uh, and it was uh, it was really untenable um, the the mayor wisely called for a recess for for tempers to cool I just walked out because people were yelling at me uh, incoherently <laughs> in a way uh, you, you can't really understand all the things that are being said, uh, except for the isolated, threatening statements that you would hear, um, things like that. And while, so, yeah, while we can talk about what what happened, uh, what I what I want to chat with you today about yeah. basically is what's the steps that have been put in place so that this doesn't happen again. Because, as I said off the camera a, f- a few hours ago before this interview, while this was going on in Leduc. It was happening in Estevan as well, the exact same scenario, not the exact where there had to be a recess. But what has Leduc put into place that will make people feel comfortable going to council and presenting to council and not get so off the rails like it saw in June of this year? Sure. So that's a work in progress. Yeah. Uh, immediately after that, uh, we had to have a security debriefing and uh, we were advised that uh, you know, the safety of people gathered could not be guaranteed. Uh, and so one of the steps that was taken to was to temporarily suspend uh, public commentary. And I have to say that's controversial and I'm not 100% in favor of that either. Uh, it was one thing to say, let's, let's, let's have a cooling off period. Um, in my view is that we're into the period now where we can move on. Uh, I'm not, I'm not. So uh, you still have no public commentary as of today? That's, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's still temporarily suspended. And, suspended. and so uh, we've come together as a council to work through uh, what are some changes that could be made to public commentary where that will still allow most people to be able to come and say most things uh, because I find it to be a very valuable, valuable exercise. Um, that being said, uh, the, the final form has not come out and uh, it, it, that's going to be a subject of public debate because uh, a lot of municipalities are dealing with this right now. You just mentioned Estevan. Uh, some municipalities have gotten rid of it altogether and, and, and the feeling some in some places is in this day and age when people uh, want to come and spew whatever kind of distasteful things that they learned over uh, YouTube University. Or Reddit or yeah. <laughs> the dark, deep dark Reddit. Yeah. That, that, you know, that's, you just can't have that anymore. Um, I don't agree, and maybe I'll be proven wrong, that that's just something that can't be had. Maybe maybe that's that'll be something in the, in the future, but for the time being, I find public commentary to be very helpful. Um, and I don't want, I want it to be the least restrictive that it can be. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, one, one, uh, an issue in our community is homelessness and people uh, in the community are, they don't like to see uh, people that are obviously experiencing mental health uh, uh, issues, uh, people sleeping in doorways, uh, people uh, leaving a mess behind. Uh, and so it causes some tension, and that's that's the truth in every community um, in Alberta and probably throughout the country these days. Um, <clears throat> and so there was pushback about the the homeless shelter that we have, and so on one on at least one occasion, uh, clients of the shelter came to say, "Look, this is how it's helped me in my life. I was." A wreck before, but because now I don't have to worry about this one fundamental part of survival, having a sh- roof over my head in cold weather, <laughs> I was able to get my stuff together and people saying, and now I've been, for instance, six months sober, or now, for instance, I have a job. Yeah. 
Uh, and so that was very helpful. And if we had had a lot of barriers in place, you got to show ID, you got to prove your residence, uh, we got to vet what you're going to say ahead of time uh, to an undue degree, maybe we wouldn't have heard those stories. Uh, so I don't want to lose that. But at the same time, the safety of the public, safety of our, of our administration, our staff, and of the councillors is still important. Is it a double edged sword, though? Because while you have those great stories about the homeless and how people have gone through the system and come out the other side, you have incidents like you have in June. So you have to take the good with the bad when you have those public commentary. And I know you're going through the process of trying to figure out where the sort of gr the, the good period moment is so you can allow public commentary. But shouldn't it be just carte blanche and anyone have the right to say whatever they want to say at a public hearing because you're an elected official and you're, you've put yourself in there to listen to these comments, good, bad, or ugly? I suppose that's, <laughs> that's, that's a philosophical way to, yep. to approach it. Uh, I think practically uh, safety is important. Um, staying on top, the topic of city business is important as well. For instance, if someone, I mean, lawyers shouldn't do this. We indulge in this all the time. <laughs> like an absurd example to show that there should be a limit and yeah. so for instance if a thousand people show up and said i want to speak, spend 10 minutes talking about my favorite television show and w w it would be reasonable to cut that off i think and so there's clearly a limit somewhere uh and if someone came in and just to be more severe like clearly uttering threats or or, or things that are criminal speech that's the kind of thing we should be able to curtail I, and i don't and I don't think that's where the line is. It's somewhere, it's somewhere back a bit to keep people on topic so that we are able to hear what's on people's minds, good and the bad. Uh, people get a fair hearing, but we're not driven off course with things that are, that are, that are not pertinent and to, to city business and are not uh, affecting the, 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 the psychological safety of uh, members of the community. So I mentioned earlier in, in our like sort of beginning question that this kind of put Leduc on the national stage for a bit, and yes. not in a good way. No. <clears throat> as a counselor, as a representative, as someone who cheerleads their community, um, have you seen this pendulum swing a little bit back, say, okay, it's a isolated incident, what we saw in June, but we're all great people in our community. and the majority of us don't have those views that you saw on display at that council meeting. Yeah, that that is one of the good parts of it because it did result in people kind of coalescing around this to say like, okay, well, this is not our view. Uh, we want to see people valued and supported in the community and so we're going to spend, stand up to that kind of speech. And so as a result, I will, maybe not as a result, but it, what a contributing factor to, for instance, like a pride group being organized in Leduc right now is that uh, they want to be able to counter in a positive way, not a, in a confronta confrontational way, the the kinds of uh, fallacies and, and, and lies that are being spread uh, under the guise of, uh, you know, protecting children or what have you, uh, the, the canard about, about grooming, uh, which is, you know, as someone that works in criminal justice, the grooming is very serious, and it's just thrown around as as though you can just call it anyone that you disagree with, uh, you know, someone, you know, someone who's trying to sexually abuse children. And I, I worry that the overuse of, of the term in that way is going to make people think like, okay, what do you really mean? Is is this really grooming? Like grooming is a serious problem, yeah. and, and, and it, it 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 occurs not at drag queen story hour i went on canley and didn't find a single decision of some of a drag queen being uh, convicted of sexually abusing a child but what you do see is uh, people in youth groups uh, clergy uh, sports coaches uh, family members family friends grooming children um, and it's a serious problem and then people conveniently i think have, have have just kind of latched on to an easy target and and they want to exploit people's normal um, wishes to protect children, um, and it drives them in the wrong direction. So the good, the bad, 
What's the future look like now? Because next year, Pride <clears throat> season, Pride month is coming around next June as well. Or is Leduc looking at as a council? Because I know there's organizations in your community that have probably set up and who support the L 2S LGBTQ community. But what what's council doing next year to show their support? Are you going out? Are you walking or meeting with groups as well? Are your council members your mayor? Absolutely. Uh, every like every member of our council voted in favor of the Pride Crosswalk, for instance, and we have been celebrating Pride for, for years, and I think there's a lot more that could be done. Uh, I think it remains to be seen like what we're going to be doing in, in, in next year. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not cowed uh, by, by what's happened. Uh, were you not? Are you, were you like well were, what I mean you know I'm not like I'm not gonna be pushed in a direction to, 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 to act in a way that, I, that, that, that that's not in accordance with my with my moral bearings uh, okay because the, the question that usually dev never comes up in this type of situation is security yeah you make a public statement with like you did you make a display like you did there are people out there who may potentially cause harm were you, did you feel un, <clears throat> unsafe when you gave that speech, or were you proud that you were able to stand up and show your support to the LGBTQ community? Double-edged question. Well, I mean, I mean, you're, you're playing the lawyer on me. Well, here, well, well they, <laughs> could, they could both be true, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, being in a room with, uh, full of angry people yelling at you and some of them yelling threats, that's concerning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whether did you feel concerned for your safety at that time you know what when you're in a moment it's hard to know what you're feeling right <laughs> that's true and so uh i was determined i was focused on on on, on the yeah. task on the task okay yeah um i want to thank you i want to thank you first as a member of the lgbt community for standing up and doing what you did because uh, we need more people like yourself. And, okay. uh, I want to thank you for doing this interview because we always talk about what happened. We never talk about what's going to happen or the aftermath. So thank you for talking about that aftermath and giving your a, kind of a behind the scenes look of what LeDuc's doing in the aftermath of what happened in June. Well, it is of course my pleasure. I always like talking to you. <laughs> uh, and I like, I, like, I like pointing you towards uh, the people that I known through life uh, all across Canada that, that, that have uh, gone down the same road as me. And I know you've interviewed the, some and of them. I, I'm going to say it live on air, but you are a friend of the show awesome. officially. Awesome. Very good. Ryan, much appreciated. Thanks so much. Cross Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on cross-border interviews where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. And finally, we leave Alberta for a few minutes to head to Atlantic Canada, where we chat with the mayor of Port Hawkesbury and the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, Brenda Chisholm Beaton. Mayor Chisholm Beaton recently got back from the Atlantic Mayor's Congress in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Newfoundland and Labrador. This organization, as many of you may know, is deeply committed to improving municipal governments and fostering a unified voice to advocate for communities in the Atlantic region. The Atlantic Mayor's Congress, much like the name suggests, brings together mayors and municipal leaders from all corners of Atlantic Canada to collaborate and tackle the challenges that municipalities are facing. It is an opportunity for communities of all sizes and backgrounds to come together share insights, and find solutions that benefit their communities. So, uh, uh, Mayor, I, I, I guess you, you've just recently come back from the uh, Atlantic Mayor's Con Conference, and I want to make sure I get this right here. Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Yes. Um, can you give me a brief overview of what what, what transpired over the three-day conference there? Um, well, certainly it's a an important opportunity for networking. So, um, mayors and wardens from all across Atlantic Canada, they get together and they have an opportunity to talk about 
the really great things that are happening in their communities, but also um, share in the challenges that um, more oftentimes than not are the same <laughs> across our municipalities. So, um, you know, certainly some of the, the big conversations that, that were had over the last couple of days in, in Goose Bay were around housing, um, around financial challenges and the need to, to modernize the way that uh, municipalities are funded or look for new revenue streams for municipalities because more and more and more uh, we're expected to do uh, take on uh, work that aren't traditional municipality uh, responsibilities. And, you know, we're expected to do it with less, less funds, which, um, you know, is not a formula for success at all. So um, definitely some conversations around the need for financial reform there. Um, definitely some uh, conversations around climate, um, climate adaptation, um, climate change. How do we be proactive? Um, how do we have better responses from other orders of government when we do have extreme weather? Um, because, you know, once the storm passes, like, that's that's not it. You know, there's a lot of repairs that need to be done. There's a lot of assistance that, that residents require. Um, for example, Hurricane Fiona, there are still trees um, all across, uh, you know, that, that really need to be cleaned up and, and trying to determine whose responsibility is it to fund that. Um, there certainly was um, some conversations had about uh, health care recruitment and retention um, and just celebrating really all of the 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 wonderful um, I guess the 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 wonderful thing about being an elected official in Atlantic Canada. And Atlantic Canada is a very unique and special place. And you know certainly there are very passionate, um, leaders working at the local government level. And it was such a pleasure to be able to connect uh, with all of them, you know, share some laughs, you know, share some frustrations and, you know, and also like look to the future, like what, what are some things that we can do together? You know, are, is there some advocacy that we can do through other organizations like, um, like the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and, and equivalents uh, across Atlantic Canada? Um, yeah, so like, and what can we do as a region with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities as well? So uh, it was a really, a really great Congress. Uh, I wanted to thank Mayor George, uh, you know, for his hospitality and his team. Uh, it was a wonderful adventure. There was a hike and berries eaten <laughs> and I am still alive. <laughs> um you, you've come... like, you try those red berries <laughs> and then I would eat them like oh they're kind of like cranberries but worse <laughs> oh um, you're not supposed to eat them yet <laughs> you, you've come away from this three-day conference and you now take back the messages that you've gathered from uh, your other elected officials across the Atlantic uh, Atlantic provinces uh, just in a brief uh, quick statement if possible um what what's the step now? Because I know this co Congress meets twice a year, if I'm not mistaken, because it just recently met in Nova Scotia earlier this year, uh, met in Newfoundland and Labrador. So what does the what do the mayors like yourself now have to do to make sure that the issues that were raised at this Congress don't fall on deaf ears and just don't go anywhere? Uh, absolutely. So um, uh, in my role as the federation, the the Federation of of Canadian Municipalities as a member, sorry. So many acronyms in this world. Um, so because I'm the president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, that uh, is a seat at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities table. Um, so I did do an update with regard to um, the work that the, the FCM is doing um, and all of the challenges that were raised uh, by the members in attendance. I took down some notes um, and I will definitely be moving those forward to the FCM. So, uh, and there are other concerns and comments uh, will go back to um, the Nova Scotia Federation uh, equivalent. So like, um, and if there are any advocacy work that steps that need to come uh, from that, we will do that. Our next Congress is in uh, Summerside in Prince Edward Island. And um, so what we've kind of, um, as some outcomes from this mayor's Congress uh, is, you know what, 
housing is such a huge uh, item with so many moving working parts. Um, rather than having maybe an hour or two aside on an agenda to have that discussion, maybe we need to have like a full day workshop to kind of wrap our heads around this and determine some you know critical pathways that we as municipalities can 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 do on the housing file. So like we do have. Um, some items and ideas that we discussed uh, over the last couple of days that we're going to kind of move forward as okay. And as we go, we're going to have continuing to have better establish better ways to work together as we continue to meet uh, uh, two times a year as a, a group of Atlantic mayors and wardens. Uh, Mayor Chisholm Beaton, thank you so much for this. Greatly appreciate it. You are most welcome. And that's all for today's Municipal Affairs Report for October 2nd, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and listened to this episode. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please keep those stories coming in. Share your municipal news, your municipal concerns, and municipal triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential and we're here to amplify them. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. 